55, Teutoburg Nightmares. When we left off last week, Augustus was overseeing the rise of his two grandsons, Gaius and Lucius, and dealing with the fallout from the sudden retirement of his stepson Tiberius in 6 BC. The next decade will bring even more hardship for the imperial family, as the fates intervene to visit every misery imaginable on the house of Caesar. But beyond the internal problems of the first family, the whole empire will soon be visited with the disaster to rival the massacre at Cannae and the Parthian annihilation of Crassus's eastern legions. Rome had spent its life expanding, always and ever outward. Augustus could already see, though, that the endless growth could not continue forever, that future generations would not be tasked with winning new territory for the empire, but rather keeping what had already been seized. But even he was not ready to be done with imperial conquest just yet. That was why the disaster in the Teutoburg Forest was such a heavy blow. Germania was supposed to be the last province the empire would ever need, but instead it was never taken, the final piece of the puzzle never put into place. Instead, the land beyond the Rhine would forever whisper in Rome's ear like the slave standing beside a conquering general in his triumphal chariot, reminding him that he is mortal. But before we get into all that, we need to unpack some more of the drama of the Julio-Claudian family, as events during these middle years of Augustus's reign will set the stage for the future path of the imperial monarchy. Augustus had always taken pains to have his family live exemplary public and private lives, to lead by example as the emperor tried to simultaneously renew the old Roman spirit while strangling off its republican roots. As I mentioned previously, the princeps was heavily invested in legislating sexual and marital relations to create a healthy environment within which to raise the new generation of Roman children. The only problem was that as hard as it was to legislate morality, it proved even harder to keep his own children and grandchildren in line. Behind Augustus's back, the house of Caesar was fast turning into a house of ill repute. Everyone knew it, everyone except the princeps himself. But in 2 BC, that all changed. After years of treating the back alleys of Rome as her personal playground, the exploits of Augustus' daughter Julia finally reached the princeps' ears. He had been kept in the dark, thinking her a paradigm of virtue, while all the while she carried on numerous affairs with men born both high and low, from the lowliest slave to men of the highest rank, including a member of the Gracchi family, and, perhaps most famously, Mark Antony's second son, Aulus. The shock of the revelation caused Augustus to perhaps overreact. But with clamping down on libertine sexual attitudes such a personal crusade for him, it is understandable that when his own daughter was revealed to be a prime contributor to the problem, that the sense of betrayal must have run deep. Deep enough, anyway, that against the advice of nearly everyone, he banished Julia from Rome and never allowed her to return. Her identified lovers were banished themselves or forced to commit suicide. The scandal rocked Rome as men of the most prominent families were suddenly exiled or killed. The common citizens of Rome were overcome with sympathy for Julia and her lovers, and when Augustus took to the streets, they begged him to allow them all to return. But he was not having it. The cold, cruel streak that had run through Augustus since the beginning resurfaced. Julia was dead to him. Still very much alive, though, were her two sons, Gaius and Lucius. Raised by the princeps himself, the two boys were growing fast into smart and capable teenagers. They were not perfect, though, and both earned reputations as haughty, self-indulgent, spoiled children. Augustus had tried mightily to prevent this from happening, but he could not watch them all the time, nor prevent Rome from lavishing them with their every desire practically from birth. But as the sons of Agrippa and the grandsons of Augustus, the princeps figured that there was enough noble, pragmatic, and talented blood running through their veins that as they matured, they would, well, mature. Even though Augustus wanted to accelerate the career paths of the two boys, there were limits to how far he would go. When Gaius was only 14, there was agitation in the streets in favor of Augustus appointing the boy consul. Augustus himself stood for the consulship that year so he could oversee Gaius' ceremonial transition into manhood, which took place traditionally at the age of 15. Of course, the people voted overwhelmingly in favor of the princeps, but in a surprise move, they also went ahead and elected young Gaius as his colleague. Unwilling to go that far that fast, Augustus vacated the decision and announced that Gaius could serve as consul as soon as he turned 20, but not a day before. 
He was, after all, not even a man yet. He also promised the people that Lucius would be able to follow a similar path and slated him for a consulship when he turned 20. With Tiberius now gone, Augustus needed to get both boys up to speed as soon as possible, but he didn't want to overdo it. The fall started campaign in Armenia, though, which Tiberius was to have spearheaded, left Augustus in another quandary regarding the rapidity of his grandson's rise. Specifically, he saw Armenia as the perfect opportunity to give Gaius command experience, but if he put the teenager in charge, would the whole thing backfire? The people were certainly ready enough to give the young heir a position of authority, but was Gaius ready to take it? Swallowing his misgivings, Augustus decided to appoint the boy to deal with the situation in the east. The situation being that the Parthians were once again meddling in Armenia, which interfered with Rome's own meddling, something Augustus could not tolerate. In 1 BC, 18-year-old Gaius went east and set up a base of operations on the island of Samos, from which he could project Rome's imperial power. Not far from Samos was, of course, the island of Rhodes, home these past five years to Tiberius. The melancholy stepson of Augustus, now well into middle age, seems in those five years to have grown disenchanted with his exile. Perhaps because he realized that he was not, after all, indispensable, or because, after Julia's affairs became known, Augustus had unilaterally declared her unhappy marriage to Tiberius Void, freeing him of the woman he hated. Tiberius began to ask his stepfather for permission to return to Rome a request Augustus refused to even consider, despite he- Tiberius's exile transitioned almost overnight from self-imposed to forced. With Gaius taking on his first foreign assignment and ready to step into the consulship in 1 AD, Tiberius found himself forgotten, left to wither on roads, homesick, and ignored. But we all know now that it was not Tiberius's destiny to die in obscurity. No, he was destined to succeed Augustus to the throne, So how did he get from exile back into the center of Roman power? Augustus clearly wanted nothing more to do with him, and with Gaius and Lucius progressing nicely, it would take quite a chain of events for the princeps to accept Tiberius back into his good graces. But the ancient world was a cruel and sudden place, and in the span of 18 months, Tiberius went from hated exile to heir apparent. In 2 AD, Lucius, then 19 years old and set to hold the consulship the next year, was traveling to Spain on assignment for Augustus. While he was passing through Gaul, Lucius was stricken by an illness, and before anyone could even be notified that anything was amiss, he died. Augustus was devastated. Without any sons of his own, he had raised Lucius as his own. And now, just like that, the young man Augustus had poured his heart and soul into was gone. Beyond the emotional blow, this meant that all of Augustus's hopes for a permanent Julian dynasty now rested on Gaius alone. If anything were to happen to the elder brother, Augustus did not know what he would do. A year and a half later, though, he found out. After helping resolve the situation in Armenia, which involved forging a compromise with the Parthians, whereby Rome allowed Parthia's chosen candidate to ascend to the Armenian throne, in exchange for the Parthians recognizing that Armenia was firmly in Rome's sphere of influence, Gaius was acting as a tourist in the east when news came that not everyone in Armenia was happy with the compromise. A revolt had broken out, and Gaius led the legions in to help quell the disturbances. In 4 AD, while laying siege to a small town, Gaius was wounded. The wound never healed properly, and as he traveled back to the west, the infection became worse. He died on the southern coast of Anatolia at the tender age of 24. If Augustus found the death of Lucius hard to take, the death of Gaius was absolutely devastating. The two boys he had groomed for power, who he expected to one day rule the empire, were dead. Just like that, dead. Who else could he turn to? Finally, the endless stream of letters from Tiberius would have to be opened. His request to return from exile would have to be granted. The reality that he was now the only man alive who could succeed Augustus to the throne would have to be acknowledged. Tiberius was now once again the heir apparent. Now I suppose this is a good time to address a rumor that has been kicking around since the days of antiquity. I speak, of course, of the Livia killed everyone theory of Roman imperial history. In this theory, Livia takes on the persona of the wicked stepmother, a familiar archetype that was well known to Roman dramatists, who, in her single-minded push to drive Tiberius into power, 
poisoned anyone who got in their way. First Marcellus, or Marcellus, depending on who you talk to, then Lucius, then Gaius. She arranged the banishment of Julia, and will soon enough arrange the banishment of young Agrippa Posthumus and his sister Julia the Younger. She was even accused of eliminating her own son Drusus, who was suspected of having Republican sympathies. These accusations have been around since it became clear that young Julian men in line for the throne had a habit of dying young and suddenly, but are of course given their fullest voice in the BBC miniseries I, Claudius. Having somehow gone my entire life without ever actually seeing the show, I decided to write that particular wrong and have recently been watching it with the utmost enjoyment. I, Claudius is of course awesome, and anyone who is listening to this podcast will thoroughly enjoy it, but all I can say is... Robert Graves really, really didn't like Livia. She is portrayed as evil and manipulative right down to the core. I don't think there is a sympathetic moment for her in the entire series. All I can say about this is that we should remain skeptical about such portrayals. Even the Latin historians, Suetonius especially, who specialized in gossip, acknowledge that there is no proof of anything and that the rumors were likely concocted by enemies of the regime particularly enemies of Tiberius, who wished to discredit the entire Claudian half of the Julio-Claudian dynasty. We should also keep in mind that in the ancient world, sudden death was not exactly unheard of. Disease ran rampant, and medicine was barely out of its infancy. There is no need to concoct a tale about a diabolical woman secretly assassinating her son's rivals to explain the fact that Lucius got sick and died, or that after being stabbed with a sword, Gaius' wound never healed properly, and he died. This is all to say that basically, I'm not going to go there. To me, Livia will remain a staunch promoter of her son's interests and a ruthless defender of the new imperial regime, but I will not be portraying her as the embodiment of pure malevolence. But go check out I, Claudius. Not for nothing is it regarded as some of the finest television ever produced. So, moving on. After the death of Gaius, Tiberius returned to Rome, He was quickly adopted by Augustus, and his at-large powers, which had lapsed during his exile, were renewed and extended by the Senate. As a condition of his adoption, though, Tiberius was required to adopt his now 20-year-old nephew Germanicus. With Germanicus having blood ties back to Augustus through his mother Antonia, the princeps hoped that after a temporary diversion through Tiberius, power would wind up back in the hands of a Julian doubly ensuring that in the future power would remain in Julian hands, Germanicus was married to Augustus' granddaughter Agrippina. When the princeps died, Tiberius would reign by necessity, but then the family of Germanicus would take their rightful places on the throne. It was lucky that Germanicus was turning out to be such a promising young man, because the rest of his family was a disaster. Agrippa Posthumus, the last surviving son of Marcus Agrippa and Julia, had grown into a violent and cruel young man. In 7 AD, after numerous complaints and indiscretions, Augustus finally had to give up, and Posthumus was forced into exile, banished to a tiny island that was little more than a rock. The next year, Julia the Younger followed in her mother's footsteps, first into a life of moral flexibility, carrying on her own series of infamous affairs, and then exile at Augustus's orders. Rumors held, though, that she was not banned in part in a plot against the Augustan regime. Her first husband had been executed on charges of treason, and some supposed that his wife had more than a little to do with the whole affair. Whenever his daughter or grandchildren popped up in conversation, Augustus was known to quote from the Iliad, Ah, to have never married, and childless died. Rounding out the Hall of Shame were Germanicus's sister, Le- 